Every moment in time creates questions the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear, and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... The Extraordinary. Mayday, mayday, this is Montego Bay. The Extraordinary is the dark and stormy night that turned an ocean yacht race into a nightmare. Raging seas and ferocious winds made the sea a death trap. This tragedy would be, is the worst ocean racing tragedy that Australia, Australia has ever encountered. But for one man, a miracle. He was rescued by a search vessel that was not looking for him. It is the eerie, distant hum that echoes through the valleys of the New Mexican desert, giving hundreds nausea, nosebleed, vertigo, and dizziness. It's, it kind of feels like something is buzzing inside your head, like there's something going on inside your body. The extraordinary is the family heirloom restored to pristine condition after being damaged beyond repair. Just started to scream and said, well, look at this, I can't believe it. And there it was, just as it was, perfect in the condition it was when we first bought it. No one touched the picture. No one tampered with the image. It just suddenly reappeared. It is the regular appearance of romance novelist Barbara Cartland's pet dog, Jimmy. And I saw him first in the hall, and I was putting some flowers on the table. And I looked down and saw the dog, you see, and I said to him, move out, come you're in the way. And I heard him push with my foot. Of course, there was nothing there. Jimmy keeps sleeping in the hall of her house. But he was actually put to sleep in 1955. The Extraordinary is the time when in broad daylight a ghost appeared, not to one, but to three members of a family. Everyone was fairly horrified when they first saw the guy in the garden. It sat so strangely with all of us that it was very difficult to know what to say. It's like being in a state of shock. A figure clear as day, working in the garden. A man who did not exist. Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding. Tonight, on The Extraordinary. More on the ghost that three people saw a little later. Good evening, I'm Warwick Moss. The sea can be a deadly foe. Whipped by strong winds and breaking waves, the ocean is one thing man has never tamed. Old sailors will tell you, if you want to live in harmony with the sea, you must respect it. That lesson was learnt at human cost in 1983, when an ocean yacht race turned into a titanic struggle of life and death. This tragedy would be, is the worst ocean racing tragedy that Australia, Australia has ever encountered. It was a tragedy that would cost four lives. One that still has old sea salts shaking their heads in wonder. But mixed with the tragedy is a story of endurance, heroism, and a rescue that defied all the odds. It was a story that began with an ocean yacht race off the east coast of Australia, just outside Sydney Harbour. The date, April the 15th, 1983, the time around 8.30 p.m. And the conditions, treacherous. I was only young, I was 19 at the time. In hindsight, I shouldn't have probably been out there on those conditions. And uh, I believe probably that um, some other crews or skippers of the night would agree with me. Matt Hayes is one of Australia's most experienced yachtsmen a sailor who's been in love with the sea since he was four years old. But thinking back to that night in April 1983, he's convinced it was his worst race ever. 
Matt was a crewman on board Montego Bay, one of 15 yachts in the race. He remembers vividly the moment of crisis, the moment Montego Bay skipper Chris Hatfield sounded the alarm with these words. Quick, get on the radio, send out a mayday message and fire off some flares. So Richard Connolly went downstairs into the cabin with water up more or less up to his waist. He got on the radio and he was saying, mayday, mayday, anyone out there who can hear us, we're sinking off Sydney heads. Mayday, mayday. But Richard Connolly's mayday and flare were too late. Montego Bay was taking water. The yacht was just moments away from disaster. Within 40 seconds of firing that flare, there was the boat sort of sinking beneath us. I remember um, my father saying to me, if you're ever on a boat and it starts sinking, um, don't actually jump off until you know it's going to sink beneath you and go to the bottom. So as the boat's sinking from its stern, I'm sort of walking up the bow of the thing, basically standing right on the bow as, sort of, as it sinks beneath me, but I jumped clear out of the way so I wouldn't get caught in any of the rigging and get pulled down with the boat. Um, so there we were, five of us, just floating in the water. Minutes later, in that pitch black night, Matt Hayes and the skipper was separated from their shipmates. They could just make out the lights from shore. But there were kilometres of ocean between them and safety. Nevertheless, they struck out for land. While we were in the water, we could actually see the police launch a couple of miles south of us, but we knew, we knew they were looking for us because they had this big spotlight, but they were nowhere near us, so they were never a possibility to rescue us. Matt knew search was underway, but as the minutes, the hours ticked by, the possibility of rescue seemed dimmer and dimmer. Within three hours of being in the water, I saw the silhouette of a yacht sail past us between us and the shore. At this stage, we'd actually swam probably about uh, one and a half, one to about, about a kilometre towards the shore. So we'd converged on the, co on the coast somewhat. Hey! And I started yelling out, help, help. And Chris Hatfield at this stage said, you know, you must be, you must be on your last legs. You must be hallucinating or seeing things. And he said, you're not, you're not seeing anything. You're just dreaming, just shut up. So near and yet so very, very far. It seems that the wind, the sea, and ironically, sounds from the shore, confused the crew on board that would-be rescuer, Solitaire. One of the crew members on board, they thought that the sound was coming from the shore. Now on the shore, in one of the houses on the top of the hill, there was a big party going on. So here we are swimming in the water, and we could actually hear this party, we could hear the music, we could hear people screaming and carrying on and dancing, and here we are sort of swimming for our lives to the coast. By some miracle though, Solitaire changed course. After hours in the freezing sea, Matt Hayes and Chris Hatfield were saved. On board the rescue boat Solitaire, they realised that their three mates were still out there somewhere, battling for their lives. Within an hour of arriving at the hospital, um, two of the other crew members, Michael Condon and Robert Rust, arrived as well. Um, and then um, that, was probably, that was about two or three o'clock in the morning, from memory. At, um, but then we'd, I'd actually fallen asleep. But I can recall at six o'clock in the morning, one of the nurses came into the room and said, we've found the fifth crew member. And there was just absolute relief. Thank God we found Richard. Richard. Richard Connolly, the crewman on board who sent the Mayday message and lit the flares. The man who first alerted the rescue fleet and probably saved his mates' lives. Now it was early morning and it seemed he too was okay. But was he? Let's go back a couple of hours to when the search was at its height. The water police were out in force and Daryl Carl was on one of their launches. I could hear this man calling from the water, calling out help, but I couldn't tell where he was coming from because the wind and the waves, it sounded like it was over there and then it sounded like it was over there and uh, we just went around in circles looking for him. You were close enough to hear him talk to you, but you couldn't see him and you couldn't uh, save him and you sort of felt a bit empty when you got back that, you know, that 
sort of let him down or something, but it was just the circumstances of the weather. At that stage, everyone was convinced the man they could hear was Richard Connolly, the hero of the Montego Bay disaster. Help, though, was to come purely by chance, in the form of a fishing boat on its way back to port. The crew hauled in the exhausted sailor, the sailor who seemed to be Richard Connolly. Jerry Perkins was coordinating the search that night, and today he's still amazed by what happened next. The police launch, naturally enough, went to rendezvous uh, with the fishing vessel, and when they uh, spoke to the particular person who had been rescued, they naturally the first question they said to him was, uh, are you off the Montego Bay? And he said, oh, no, I'm off the Waikiki Mukau. And they said, what is the Waikiki Mukau? The Waikiki Mukau was, in fact, another yacht in that ill-fated race. Another yacht that went down. Unlike the Montego Bay, however, there were no flares, no maydays from the Waikiki Mukau. No one knew it was in distress, let alone sinking. The man rescued from the sea eight hours after the race began was definitely not Richard Connolly from Montego Bay. He was Neville Walters from Waikikamukau. Stunned, the water police asked him this question. How many of you were on board Waikikamukau? He said, oh, four of us. So that meant then, of course, that we then had three persons missing off uh, the Waikiki Mukau and still the one person missing off uh, Montego Bay. All the rescuers were looking for the fifth member of our yacht, the Montego Bay. So no one knew that the Waikiki Mukau had sank because they didn't get a distress message out. They didn't send off any flares at all. Um, they just happened to find Neville floating around there in the ocean. He's the luckiest man I know. Um, he spent 12 hours in the water that night, at least 12 hours, and the water it was freezing cold. And uh, I don't know, I just don't know how he survived it. Not only that. Remember those shouts for help that Darrell Carl heard from the deck of the water police launch? As it turned out, they were coming from Neville Walters. They brought him into the station and he said to me, I know you. Why didn't you look at me? Why didn't you pick me up? And I said, well, I could hear you, but I couldn't see you. He said, oh, he said, I could see you, and you'd come up to me, and then you'd go away. And I said to him, how come you didn't freeze to death? He said, I was too bloody scared to freeze to death. Neville Walters was one of five sailors rescued that terrible night. Another four perished. Among them, Richard Connolly from Montego Bay, the man they all thought had survived the ordeal. Richard Connolly, the person who sent off the flare and, and sent out the May Day, he was the, one, he was the man that lost his life. So he was the hero. For Matt Hayes, it was a night of horror. The night he lost a close friend to the sea he'd loved since childhood. But it was also the night he learned a lot about life and living. You know, the next week I wanted to go out and do parachute jumping and I wanted to go scuba diving and I wanted to sort of climb Mount Everest and all these sort of things. I mean, you know, here I am, I've just survived three hours in the, in the ocean and you sort of feel like you can do anything. At the same time, you know, my life's been, um, been very fulfilling. I've continued with my sailing and I, and I love it with a passion and, you know, all aspects of the sport and um, that incident's not going to sort of stop me from doing it. A while ago, we brought you a story of the bizarre phenomenon of crop circles, strange shapes that appear in wheat fields around the world. For years, scientists have been baffled by the magnetic frequency that accompanies them. But now, the experts are even more mystified by another sound that seems to have come from nowhere. A hum that defies explanation. In the desert, at twilight, 
when the air becomes still and the silence so absolute that the ears sense footsteps of an insect on the bark of a pinion bush. When a voice two valleys away tempts the hearer to answer. When a bird over a distant ridge and out of sight can so disturb the quiet that instinct says to recoil. When the world is that silent, that still, that's when you hear the hum. Once you have heard the hum, it stays forever. It's, it, it kind of feels like something is buzzing inside your head, like there's something going on inside your body. By day, at night, outside and indoors, the relentless rhythmic hum causing dizziness, nosebleeds, vertigo, anxiety, and for some, near insanity. It's like pressure on my ear, but just, you know, like a diesel uh, idling. It's called the Taos Hum, named after a small town not far from Santa Fe, a place that's inspired artists like Georgia O'Keeffe and today attracts thousands of painters and sculptors who seek a creative rush from the dry coral earth of the New Mexican desert. Taos used to be a peaceful place where 4,000 inhabitants went about crafts and lives with calm. But today, dozens have moved away and more are threatening to pull stakes unless someone can stop the hum. Scientists have been working to identify its source for a year, but the lead investigator, Dr. Joe Mullins, admits his team of university experts are as baffled as they were on day one. We thought we found something for a while, but it turned out to be from the power lines and uh, people who, when he converted that to sound, people said, no, it's not what it sounds like. So we had to eliminate that. Not everyone hears the hum. It takes a special condition or pair of ears to detect its pulsating presence somewhere out there. Those who hear it are known as the hearers. Those who don't are regarded as potential hearers. For in many cases, the victims only detect the hum after many months. Jenny Bird's husband heard it long before she did. I was waiting at the bus station to pick up my kids from the bus, and I thought the bus was driving up. But you can see for miles around here, and I looked everywhere, and there was no vehicle, there was no bus. It's more a sensation, it's more a vibration, a feeling, really, than an audible thing. And I think the scientists have confirmed that it's not an acoustic noise, it's more a vibration that isn't on it, that you don't really hear, that you sense more. In the beginning, Jenny was a doubter. Her friends, the Saltzmans, Bob and Catania, made the hum problem public in 1991. We don't sleep well anymore. Our pulses race. We have shortness of breath attacks. The Saltzmans weren't your average couple. Not many people listened back then. Eventually, Bob and Catania left town. Since those days, the hearers' numbers have increased to the hundreds. A lot of people felt that their life is just invaded. And here they are hearing you, so they can't get away from it. And they feel that their privacy is invaded. Some describe the hum as sounding like a distant diesel engine. Others say it's like the audio reverberation that happens when car windows are wound down. Most agree that the irritation factor is intense. Late at night, the hum is the fly or mosquito buzzing overhead, or the dripping faucet, ever loudening, ever infuriating but magnified a hundredfold. The mystery of the Taos hum has reached such a pitch that government officials have assembled a team of scientists to investigate the hum, spearheaded by Dr. Mullins, who is professor of mechanical engineering at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Dr. Mullins has tried everything to trace its origin. We did a lot of measurements and with some extremely sensitive equipment. Uh, the sound equipment was particularly sensitive. We had one microphone especially designed to cover this range, and it was uh, about 10,000 to 100,000 times as sensitive as the ear in this region. It didn't pick up anything but, back, but just smooth background noise, no, no spikes, no tones, no hum. 
Another victim, antique store owner Robert Fowry, moved all the way from Paris, France, to live in Taos, only to encounter the hum. To me, it's like if you dive into a pool and you go very deeply into the water, <clears throat> then you, you hear sort of a buzz. You know, you have a, a pressure in your ear, and that's exactly what it feels like. Jenny Bird's brother became an instant hearer when he visited. Whenever he comes to visit from California, he gets a bloody nose. One night, he woke up. He knew nothing about the sound. He'd never heard anything about it. It was just when it was, we were just talking about it with the Salzmans. And he was, he got up in the middle of the night and was walking around in the yard saying, I, something's going on. I, I'm hearing something. I feel like I'm going crazy. And his nose was bleeding. And, and we said, well, it must be the sound. A lot of hearers blame the government. They believe a secret Defense Department underground experiment is the source of the hum. The Pentagon denies it. When word of the hum reached the national media, a sort of homophobia developed across the country. It got in Newsweek, it got in uh, the front page story in the Philadelphia Inquirer, it was in the Washington Post, the networks have picked it up. All, all of a sudden we're getting letters and calls from all over the country and, and saying that, yeah, they've heard the same thing for years. But Jenny and Robert and a few hundred other hearers of the Taos hum know it's not imagination. When I first heard about the sound, I thought the people that heard it were crazy. But once you experience it, it's undoubtedly there. It's like seeing or hearing is believing. The reason we hear it so well is that we live at 8,000 feet in altitude away from the sound of the city away from everywhere, and all you hear at night are the coyotes, the bear, and this is it. So the sound is amplified to where you can hear it. So Dr. Mullins and his team continue to search, listen, and monitor above and below ground. It's a medical mystery. We've had to develop whole new uh, sources, sound sources, and whole new detectors to go inside the ear because the conventional ones don't work very well with this frequency range. Or maybe it's just the humbug. We've told ghost stories before, some based on legend, others individual experience. Most so-called ghosts appear at night and rarely are they seen by more than one person. But the strange apparition in this story appeared in broad daylight and was seen not by one, but three people. Buying a home can be a trap for young players with all kinds of pitfalls. Some you can guard against. Some, as one Australian family discovered, you can't. That family was the Middletons, Judy, Brian, and their daughter, Heather. They remember the day 20 years ago they found their dream home in Tasmania. But the ink on the contract had hardly dried before the Middletons' dream began inexplicably turning to a nightmare. As Judy wandered through the corridors of the old cottage that was to be her new home, she began to feel something was amiss. It was ice cold. It just struck me as being ice cold. And then the dogs first stood up on the end. I noticed that. And um, then the, this feeling left us. Judy Middleton had her heart set on the house and shrugged off that feeling. She continued her investigations from the outside, but as she peered through a window into one of the deserted rooms... And there was an elderly man leaning over an elderly lady in a rocking chair. An elderly couple. He was wearing dungarees. She had a shawl wrapped around her shoulders. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know whether it was a ghost or what it was. It was so real. It wasn't just an outline. It was a solid figure, two solid figures there. And they were very, very real. But I knew they weren't there when we had looked previously through the house only a few minutes before. 
film. By now, Judy Middleton was very confused and a little alarmed. No one was living in that house. No owners, no tenants, no one. The next day, we went back and had a look and I, again, and I could see their faces at the window, this elderly man and elderly lady. They were looking out the lounge window and I never said anything. And after that, I went off the house completely. I think I, got, I started to get quite anxious about it, you know, and in the end I demanded, well, what's really wrong with it? It's not the, you know, and she said, well, actually, I think it's um, haunted. Haunted by an elderly couple. A corridor that was inexplicably freezing on a warm afternoon. A presence that made the family dog's hackles rise in fear. And when she mentioned the coldness, it struck me that while I was signing the contract with the real estate agent, there was an intense cold in that lounge. And I couldn't... Um, it, it was so profound, the cold, I couldn't explain it, you know. The next weekend, Brian, Judy and young Heather Middleton set out again to visit the house. Brian was wavering, but still skeptical. I tried to reassure Judy that she could be mistaken or imagined it or, you know, maybe it's a trick of light or something, but she was very, very um, positive that she'd seen this. As they approached the house, all three of them saw something unusual. There in the front of the garden was a man, apparently digging potatoes. A man wearing dungarees. A man Judy recognised immediately. She was angry. She was saying, he's the man, he's the man. He's in the garden digging potatoes. He's the man I saw. He was clearly digging. He didn't turn his head. I remember that. Um, he, didn't, he didn't turn his head, although I slowed down. I'm ex I expected him to because a lot of people who are working out front generally glance up, you know, they see a car going by. He was just digging, very intent on what he was doing. Everyone was fairly horrified when they first saw the guy in the garden for different reasons. Um, my, my own reason was I was sort of horrified that somebody was taking off with our potatoes because I already assumed the house was ours. Mum was fairly horrified because she recognised the fellow because she'd seen him previously. And Dad was fairly horrified because he likes vegetable gardens and had spent a lot of time working out where he was going to put one. And here was a vegetable garden full of potatoes he hadn't noticed previously. Although Heather was only seven years old at the time, even she remembered the front garden. Only days before, it was all lawn with no sign of a vegetable patch. And as we drove further along the road, there was a great discussion as to how to handle this. Dad's not a particularly confrontational person, so Mum and I were nagging him to actually get out of the vehicle and say something to this guy. And Dad was becoming anxious because he doesn't like confrontational situations at all. But when the Middletons reached the house and the garden, there was no one there to confront. Not only that, no potatoes. No vegetable patch. Nothing. I don't believe in ghosts or fairies or flying saucers or any of those things. If it had just been a gentleman who had been in our garden one minute with two sacks of potatoes and the next minute had gone, there'd be absolutely nothing unusual about that. Let's face it, he could have been taking them illegally and, and now had, had shot through. But I still can't explain how you could have got a large dug area of, his, of ground with potatoes in it and the next one it had it converted back to lawn. I still can't understand that. Not surprisingly, the Middletons decided they could do without these ghostly tenants and the house they thought would be their dream home. Surprisingly though, the real estate agent agreed to tear up the contract and cancel the sale. He also managed to shed some light on the mystery of this apparently haunted cottage. He had been told that maybe that there was a man and a woman in the house and the old lady had been missing and that the man, they were told, the man had been um, put, had probably killed her and buried her in the garden. 
Since that point in time, we probably only discussed it a half a dozen times. Very briefly, when somebody else comes out with a, a ghost story sort of thing, you say, well, yeah, well, we had a funny incident occur. But it, it sat so strangely with all of us that it was very difficult to know what to say. It's like being in a state of shock. When strange things happen, we're often tempted to question our own sanity. Did we really see what we thought we saw? Hear what we thought we heard? Questions we've all asked at some time or another. And even when we've assured ourselves of the answer, doubts often linger. But the woman in this story has no doubt that something miraculous happened in her life. A damaged, forgotten treasure restored to its former beauty by a miracle. In 1973, we decided to take our two children to England, Europe and America. And whilst touring Rome, we visited the Vatican. And on coming out of the Sistine Chapel, Lisa spotted a brooch that the nuns were selling there. It was an inspiring day for this devout Australian family to be so close to the centre of their religious beliefs. And for seven-year-old Lisa, there was this memento, a memento which would continue to play a dominant role in her life, possibly even save it. The brooch was a child's way of saying thank you to her mother, a birthday gift after that visit to the Vatican. My mother wore it often when she went out. It was precious because obviously I'd given it to her and she loved me and that's why she wore it. For Lisa's mother, Helen, the brooch with its memories of Lisa's love became a treasure. A treasure that years after her birthday would be tarnished just by accident. I'd been out to dinner and come home and I always go and put the dirty washing in the washing machine and I went out and piled all the washing in and put it on and it wasn't until the next day that I discovered it was ruined. For the whole family that small domestic incident was devastating. Helen's husband Brian recalls what happened. It had gone through the wash and uh, Helen was in tears over it because it was sentimental to her and uh, it was just all the features of the face, all the colour and everything had gone out of it, like it was uh, taken off a tapestry and it had black hair uh, and the face was all painted, but it was just white. You could just sort of make an outline out and that's all it was, like it was real, like, uh, just gone. She showed me that it had actually disappeared, the figure had gone, there was no colour. Helen said, what do I do? I said, well, look, it's ruined, but I said, put it away, and if we ever go back, we'll take it back with us and just see if they can do something about it. For years, the faded brooch lay in a drawer, forgotten. But it was about to make a remarkable reappearance in the lives of Helen, Brian and Lisa. Another, more devastating accident struck when Lisa was 17 years old. She was involved in an horrific car crash, suffered terrible injuries, and was admitted to hospital in a critical condition. The truth was, for some time, it was touch and go whether Lisa would survive. Even today, her mother finds the subject painful to discuss, so much so that she'd asked us if she could remain anonymous. She'd been in hospital for a few, couple of months, but we thought she was ready to come out and they gave us the news that all the, all the um, treatment had failed. So we came home both crying and feeling very devastated. And I went searching for my grandmother's locket with a cross on it or something to give her when I went into hospital the next morning. And I... That's when I found the brooch in the bottom of my jewellery box and when I pulled it out, it was as good as new. A brooch bought in the Vatican as a birthday present by a loving daughter. A brooch, years later, 
ruined in a washing machine. A brooch that in a family's time of crisis somehow returned to its original beauty. Not surprisingly, everyone was astounded, especially Helen. Just started to scream and said, well, look at this, I can't believe it. And there it was, just as it was, perfect in the condition it was when we first bought it. A miracle? Maybe. A mystery? Certainly. And there was yet another mystery, or miracle, to come. From the moment the restored brooch was discovered, Lisa began a slow, yet painful recovery. When I saw the image had returned, I was astounded. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't believe it. Very, very eerie. Um, I think it probably came at a time when we both needed a little bit of faith of what was ahead, because Lisa had a few years of operations to go through. Those operations were successful. Lisa recovered totally. We'll never know what part the brooch played in this family story, but it will always remain their most precious possession. If someone tells me something, unless I see it myself, I'm very, you know, skeptical of it, whether I believe it or not, but uh, I did see this.